I'm joined by this Powerlands as director, Ivy Camille Menigutso. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I know you've been on tour, um, so you've probably heard so many of these questions. We're going to have a little conversation here now, and then I would love to take some questions from the audience, if there are any after. So just, yeah, get thinking of your questions. Um, so yeah, my first question to you is, what pushed you to make a documentary about Indigenous land rights? Yeah, so when you're seeing the Black Mesa portion, that's my home, those are my aunts, those are my cousins, those are my uncles, those are my friends and family. Um, and so I grew up within the um, Peabody dispute that was happening over uh, land rights on the Navajo Nation. It's been a part of everyday life for me and um, when my producer and I first met he had just come back from Colombia and looking between the two communities there was really just so much similarities um, down to it was the same corporation that was devastating both of our communities and we from there realized that it wasn't just these two communities it was happening everywhere it was happening and it was always usually with the same few corporations that were terrorizing all of these you know, indigenous communities, and nobody was talking about it because these communities are very isolated. There's no running water, there's no electricity, there's no Wi-Fi, there's no cell service, like no one's posting it on TikTok or putting it on Facebook. It's very difficult to get these stories out if you can't communicate with these other, um, in these ways that are very like popular in these cities. Um, and so, because I've been a filmmaker and I've been doing this, I was very lucky to grow up with it. A lot of people in my family doing film. That's that's how this film started, and I think that's why this story is so important to be told. I do believe that indigenous people should be telling indigenous stories, um, and the secret is everyone's indigenous to somewhere. So please tell your stories. Oh, I love that. Um, and how long did it um, take you to make this film? And you know, were there any challenges that you faced along the way? I'm sure there were so many locations. Yeah. So it took us seven years. Um, and I mean, there were so many different challenges through like having a pandemic and working with editors, um, just the widespread locations. We also reached out to like 14 or 15 communities that were not featured in the uh, film because we wanted to be very careful about making sure that we were not going in and uh, like that they wanted us to be there, that we were welcomed and accepted and participating and telling the story with us. So every community was with the entire process throughout um, editing and filming and um, the various stages. I think one of the hardest things was funding, but truthfully, it's if you want to tell a story, you can just do it and then make it make it work later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Um, and what about some of the you know really rewarding parts of making this film? Uh, every community and every location that we went to open, accepted us with open arms and, you know, they would feed us and they would sit down and they would hear our stories and they would house us and they would show off their dresses and they would introduce us to their children and even if we didn't speak the same language, kind of work through a translator, every single person would come up and just like start talking to you and, you know, really inviting and accepting you and so, in a way, within my community, we treat people like family. As soon as you're welcome within our community, as soon as and you're welcome the moment you walk in the door, right? You become part of my family. You build um, Kef, which means relationships in Navajo, so you build relationships. And every single community that we interact with also built those relationships with us, and being able to see that and have all of these people, these really beautiful, smart, incredibly brave people join my family, I think was one of the most rewarding things. That sounds really beautiful. Um, I was also wondering what made you travel to like, Longmead, the Philippines, and Mexico to meet different indig indigenous groups there, um, you know, fighting for land rights and tell their stories too. You know, why not just sort of um, hone in on one village? Because uh, really, this is such a global problem, and I think when we focus too much on one one location, especially with this story you lose sight of the fact that it, like you, you focus in on the struggle of that particular location, whereas this isn't a struggle of any one location, this is a global issue that is happening. This is, we are all in this global community together. And so if, if only focusing on these five locations is the thing that you get out of this, please don't. <laughs> please look at like, what can you do in your own backyard? What is happening around you? There are so many things. I've only been here for like a week and I every single day have learned about a new area that
that you need some support and assistance, and I know that all of you are here because you want to participate in that conversation. Um, and so yeah, I just encourage you to go out, look around, what can you do around you? And that's why we try to look at so many and go on that global scale, is because if it can happen in the Philippines, and it can happen in Colombia, and it can happen in the United States, it can definitely happen here. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, thank you for that reminder. Um, so, you know, COP27 is coming up in uh, November, and you know, every year there's a climate conference and there's climate, you know, uh, the climate crisis is happening around us. I'm sure everyone's feeling it, especially in the UK, you know, we've got 40 degrees this summer, um, and it feels really real and it's really tangible. Um, I was just wondering whether you think land rights as a topic is, you know, almost deliberately missed out as a blind spot in, in discussions and how we achieve climate justice globally. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, part of the reason why it's left out of the conversation is then because a lot of the people holding this conversation have to admit that they own way more land than they should. Uh, I grew up in a society where you can't own land, it's impossible, because after you are gone, the land will still be there. Um, all you can do is shepherd the land, and we work in a three-generation platform where you are working to make the land better, not for you, not for your kids, not for your grandkids. You're working to make the land better for your great-grandkids. If you don't want children, it's your great nieces, your great nephews, you know, we, we work in that method. And if every generation alive on this planet was working to make it better for their great-grandchildren, we would be having such successes in conquering this climate crisis. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's part of the huge conversation with it. It's just like, if you, in my culture, yeah, you can't own land. We are literally put here to make it better, to make it, our future generations will thrive if we make the land today better. Yeah, I, I love that you mentioned sort of the intergenerational aspect of climate justice. Um, you know, I really felt that much in the documentary that you had all sorts of voices. Um, why was that important to you to really get, you know, people of various generations talking about uh, climate justice? I mean, because it doesn't affect any one person. Like, it's not, it doesn't, if you've been fighting the climate crisis since the 70s or the 60s, like, you can teach us so much. If you've been fighting it for 10 years, you still have so much longer to go. And if you are just joining it, like, you know, you've got such renewed energy. There's so much, this is, this is an ongoing thing that's gonna be happening for a while, and, yeah, I think the children coming back to the reservation, the children being a part of the conversation and being allowed to participate in this cultural movement in order to better our world is very important because one day you'll be gone and they'll be here and then they'll have to support the kids after that. In the director's statement, you said that for too long, others have been telling indigenous stories and that these stories are co-opted and stolen. Um, but of course, there's still an intervention to that. Do you think the tide on this is changing and more indigenous documentary makers are telling their own stories in their own languages? And if not, what are the barriers to that? Well, I definitely hope so. Um, I'm seeing it a lot. I mean, I'm doing it. I know a lot of people. We also are having more access to things with things. In a way that like cell phones are terrible for the environment, they're also really good at helping to tell stories because everyone has a full editing studio in their back pocket, and that's really cool. Um, that's something that not a lot of people had access to. We have media in our hands that we've never had, we've never been allowed access to. So I think in a way, yeah, we are finally doing it. And again, it's really important because so many times people come to my community and I see this poverty porn come out of it and I'm so sick of seeing, of the world seeing my family and my home like that because that's not how I see it and that's not what it's like. As you see in all of these communities, they're beautiful, they're vibrant, and there are so much humanity in all of them, um, but you lose that when you focus on the things that separate or differentiate us. And so, yeah, just participating in those stories and truthfully, like, you could tell a better story about this location than I could ever, because you are from here and you know it, and so I would love to see the stories that you come out with, because they're gonna be so impactful, because they're your voice and your vision, and I wanna see the world from your eyes as well. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Those are actually all the questions I've had, so I was wondering if anyone in the audience had some questions. I can see some hands up. The lights are very bright, so hopefully there's a like, grown in mind. <laughs> Yeah. Right. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for the film. I think it was amazing. Um, you mentioned, I think, earlier on, you said something like everyone's indigenous to somewhere. Um, that got me thinking because in the UK, indigeneity is often claimed by far right groups who want to establish some sort of white ethnicity. Those of us that may wish to think of us as belonging to pieces of land and defending the land are also nevertheless people whose ancestors or relatives or you know, families have been involved in settler colonialism elsewhere. And I'm troubled by the idea that we might appropriate I mean, something as distinctive as indigeneity if we use that particular way of thinking about how we respond to the land and how we defend it. I wonder what your thoughts were. I mean, Britain was also colonized. Well, I agree. The working class in Britain and were colonized, but we were also sent abroad to do the job of settler colonialism as well. And that's the purpose of colonization. It works in the cycle of abuse. You get colonized, you go out and you become the colonizer. So how do we, instead of decolonizing, how do we re-indigenize? How do we spark the conversation to go back to those roots? How do you find the way that people who lived here before were able to keep sustainable farming going for thousands of years before it got destroyed in the last few hundred? How was this possible to do before? Because it was possible, and I think if we get back to that, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sorry, there was some hands up. I don't know where. Maybe there's some Hi, um, I'd just like to start saying that, um, yeah, um, your piece moved me beyond belief. I think it's a beautiful thing when you feel solidarity with another culture that you've never encountered. Like, I've never stepped foot on the, the Americas itself, and I felt such an affinity. Um, it reminded me a lot of my Yoruba and my Berber culture from my uh, mother. Um, but yeah, um, my question was, um, if any of these multinational corporations have got in touch with you, and if they haven't, how you would respond, and if they have, how have you responded? They have not, and I'm very happy with that. No, <laughs> we're talking about like look at this resistance, um, so we try to, and we try to keep it more about the story isn't about one person or one corporation. It's about this the fact that the struggle is the common thread and the struggle is the main character throughout it. Do you think there was another hand up there? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Like, there are these few indigenous people, so you know what I mean? Like, 
this kind of thing, like how have you dealt with that, or how uh, did you want to like address that in your movie? Like this kind of, kind of thinking, you know, when people like kind of marginalize the existence of indigenous peoples as such. I don't know if this makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of indigenous people around still like doing the fight, and I hope that that gets across in the film, but there's still a lot of us. Um, yeah, it's, we definitely, like, sometimes you'll get kind of a reactionary response where someone will be like, well, but what about this type of power? And truthfully, there are answers, there are solutions to how we can continue to have energy without destroying these communities, without causing the climate crisis to exceed you know, exponentially the for every year, but we can do this in a sustainable way. And so, again, what, even with the wind power format, like all of this is greenwashing, you know, electric cars, we buy a brand new electric car, you actually double your carbon footprint, mm -hmm. which is insane. The only way to lower your carbon footprint with a lower car is to buy a used electric car, which is insanity. Mm -hmm. So, because with the only way to lower your carbon footprint means that someone else has to double theirs, but there are ways to make sustainable cars. There are totally ways to do it. There are also ways to harvest lithium without destroying communities. So there, there's a lot of it is helping that conversation and allowing that to happen. And that's just something that I like to remind people is that if you have questions to these, I don't have all of the answers, but the answers are out there. Go out there and do your own research. Making a documentary on something like paper and bulk, there are answers to paper and bulk problems. There are reusable notebooks where it like sticks directly up to your phone. There are like really you can use a whiteboard. There's so many different answers that I could come up with top of my head. And I imagine you know so much more because you're doing a film on this and I cannot wait to see it. I'm super excited. Um, so yeah, it's just like, I'd like to always have a, like an actual example of the different ways that it can be done sustainably on the end. So that's how I would answer it. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, yeah, we have one more time. Just a second. Thanks so much for the film. It's really important. Um, what was the, what did you learn? What's the experience the most from um, the interactions that you had with the communities that you met? What's, what have you sort of learned from, from them and from the work that they, that they've been doing and from the other community? Oh my God, I learned so much. I couldn't say all of it in like three days. I couldn't even put all of it in the film. That would be like, we have so much more footage. And it was just like, yeah, there was, there was so much love and compassion. And I learned about the, I learned about the creator of wind farms. I learned about all these like science facts. I also learned like how to cook some really cool food or like how to sew little things or um, different ways to like realizing like, oh, you build your rooms with cactus hearts? So do we build our rooms with cactus hearts and like little things like that. There was just so much. I wish there was one moment in time where I'd be like, this is how incredible or how impactful any one community was with me. Just truthfully all were like, Kind of phenomenal, and I hold them all to my like really close to my heart and really dearly. And I'm really happy to be able to call every single member of those communities a friend and a member of my family. Um, yeah, that's really beautiful, amazing. I actually have a few more questions. Is that okay? I don't want to hold anyone else. I think we have a bit of time. Oh, yeah, let's have one more. Night, yeah, hey, uh, thank you for wonderful I was just wondering um, about the expectation that, like, some people had when you went there and interviewed them and filmed them. Like, were they also thinking about this documentary would actually change things in the short term? Because I think this is like one of the most difficult things, I guess, when you work with communities that are like, um, like let's say, unprotected or like that are facing violation of rights because they might expect that out of this, um, yeah, something comes out like for the immediate time, time let's say. I will say sadly enough, all of these communities have already been let down, so no, they did not have expectations. Um, I will say that, again, a lot of us get like coffee corn, where it's like a white guy showing up with a whole crew and he like uses all of our water and removes our sheep and like this whole thing happens. So to see someone come in, look more like them, I think it's maybe a little bit of a hope raiser in some ways. Um, but there were not a lot of expectations and I try to be very proud of We are still in the process, we are still making this. They got to see every version of the cut that we could get to them. They were part of the communication about how we do the releases. They've been active to be a part and participating in it because 
I can't tell their story for them. I can only, um, they're only allowing me to tell their story for them. So if any of them ever rescinded or stopped, like it was immediately like anything like something that was immediately cut out. Um, so yeah, I think it was a lot of participation. Uh, the Philippines were having a hard time releasing there because there's a lot of like worry about safety for the members um, in the Philippines. Uh, and so we worked with the community to see what they wanted us to do, if they wanted to be cut out or if they wanted to be participating, if they wanted us to release the Philippines, they didn't. And they pretty much just said, like, please go out and share it. We need to raise awareness about this. Um, but yeah, so that's like, so they were a part of the act of communication. And I think that's so important if you want to work with the base communities is to remember to like, if you're going to tell a story, like, you have to allow every single person in the story to participate throughout every step. Amazing. Um, so yeah, let's have a question there. Then I've, I've got a few more, then we'll be done. Oh, 
also you know, exploring and learning about some of the people in the audience you know, that are focusing on their time and energy on a specific thing and they're getting to come out and it. So, yeah, what role do you think storytelling has within the climate justice movement? I mean, I think storytelling gives someone, especially with filmmaking, it gives someone a chance to look through your own eyes. Um, I have glasses, but I take these guys off, boom, all the time see is my phone, and it's not even because the lights, like, I can't see. But you can set a camera lens to adjust to your prescription, so I don't film with my glasses on, and when I take my camera off, it's like I'm taking my camera out of my head and moving it around. So you're literally, like, this is literally, like, how I see what this is literally my eyesight. And so when I see other kids tell stories, or I see their animation, or I see their different things, or I hear their music, and I resonate with it, like, that gives me a chance to understand you just a little bit more. It gives me a chance to see the world from a different perspective. Um, and that's the stuff that I think is so important because it's nearly impossible to understand how, like, how much the climate crisis is affecting indigenous communities unless you're there. And it, you can't all come out to the rest. It's just not good for it. So here's a way to bring it all to you, you know? Yeah, sure. Well, my final question is, um, not that you have to be doing anything, but what are you doing next? Are you touring? Are you working on any projects that you know, your new fan base should care about? <laughs> Um, yeah, we will be touring for a little bit longer. So uh, there's more dates with the London Mighty Network here in the UK, and then we're going back to the States for some more stuff. Uh, I'm currently in the process of making a documentary. In um, 1989, a woman got lost in, South uh, in a cave in South Dakota called Wind Cave. It's one of the largest caves in the entire world. It's the most complicated caving system. It's got 98% of the world's box work, which is this really cool geological formation that happens. Um, it's the birthplace of the Oglala Sioux and Lakota nations. This cave literally breathes with pressure changes outside. It like pushes air out or it sucks air in. It's absolutely stunning. Um, and she was lost for 38 hours. Fast forward to 1995, she gives birth to me, and it's my mom. Um, oh my god! That was a plot twist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't do anything without my family. So I'm, I'm working on that, and then uh, I'm about to start teaching film to some kids in Southern California. And, Wow, what an incredible person. Amazing, thank you so much.